The evidence in this case, simply put, is overwhelming and compelling. That doesn't discredit the photographs. So if she was going to go in and try to manipulate, she would have had to do it everywhere. And Ms. Hurd will tell you she doesn't have that level of talent. Aristotle is known for coining the expression modes for persuasion. These modes are known as rhetorical appeals, and they consist of logos, ethos, and pathos. They're used to persuade an audience, in this case a jury. Logos is used to persuade with logic and supposed facts. Ethos is used to persuade via the authority or credibility of the speaker. Pathos is an appeal to emotion, words, narratives, and body language that feed into the audience's emotions. Let's hear how Amber Heard's attorney Elaine uses these rhetorical appeals and other linguistic devices to defend Amber and to portray Johnny as the bad guy. Good morning, Phil. It's good to see you all again, and thank you again very much. Ben told you we will be relying on the evidence, rather than the hyperbole and the personal attacks, and he was right. The evidence in this case, simply put, is overwhelming and compelling. In the six weeks, we're going to try to show you as much as we possibly can. There are many, many, many photographs. It's important to start out with a Logos appeal, as if the case they'll be presenting will be based solely on facts. Elaine says they choose facts over hyperbole, although her repetition of the word many could be said to function as a hyperbole and Elaine uses words, vowel stress, and body language that function as hyperboles. Nevertheless, it's important for an attorney to anticipate objections. Elaine continues anticipating objections throughout her opening statement. Now, you've heard Ms. Vasquez try to say, uh oh, you, you can't trust those, it's not the originals. She's got that wrong. It's not from the original devices. Ms. Hurd took all kinds of photographs and her friends took photographs and all of those remained on the cloud and all of them have been imaged and all of them have been examined by their IT experts and they cannot discredit one photograph. She inserts the verb try before she says what Johnny's attorney said. With try to say, Elaine makes it clear that his attorney wasn't successful in making the point. Also, she changes her voice in order to downplay the importance of what she said. Try to say, uh oh, you, you can't trust those as not the originals. We've heard the word many repeated three times, and now we hear the phrase all of them repeated three times. This is called episusis, the repetition of a word or a phrase in quick succession. It's a way to emphasize a phrase in order to increase its impact and hence its memorability. And in a court case, you want the jury members to not only remember what you've said, but you also want your words to resonate with them. And rhetorical tropes will do that, at least in theory. As Elaine continues with her rebuttal of Johnny's attorney, she makes an ethos appeal that they'll have an expert ensure that all of Amber's photos are legitimate and authentic. Then she says, oh, and it's, it's got a photo editing thing. Well, all iPhones have the photo editing. It's where you can make it a little lighter or darker. You can move it to the center or not. That doesn't discredit the photographs. And we will have an IT expert who will testify that all of these are legitimate, authentic photographs. Not only that, but Ms. Hurd produced all of her different devices over the years, including her most recent laptop. And they were pulled from many, many sources. And all of them are identical. So if she was going to go in and try to manipulate, she would have had to do it everywhere. And Ms. Hurd will tell you she doesn't have that level of talent. There may be a couple of you on the, on the jury who have that talent. She does not have that talent. They're all very legitimate photographs. And listen carefully to the evidence from the experts, and you will find every single piece is authenticated and is true. When defending someone's reliability, it's important to sometimes downplay their competence or talent, which is the word Elaine chooses when she says that Amber doesn't have the talent to manipulate photos. We again notice how fast Elaine rebuts her own claims. So if she was going to go in and try to manipulate, she would have had to do it everywhere. And Ms. Hurd will tell you she doesn't have that level of ta talent. There may be a couple of you on the, on the jury who have that talent. She does not have that talent. With this rebuttal, she achieves two things. 
She makes sure to anticipate objections before the jury members have time to make them. And she makes sure to underline that only a couple of the jury members have that talent. By inference, this means that the talent is fairly rare, which logically explains why Amber doesn't have it. Thus, this lack of talent supports her case. In theory, that is, because we don't know if Elaine actually manages to convince the jury yet. Next up is a pathos appeal where Elaine emphasizes the gory details of the photos. Her main emphasis strategy is vowel stress, which has a dramatizing effect. And they show bruises, and they show cut lips, they pull, they show all kinds of... Those are all going to be there. We also are going to show you a video, and I'll talk about the, the time frame of it. Ms. Hurd took that on her iPad, um, and it was one day when she was in the, build, the, the kitchen with Mr. Depp, and it was February 10th, 2016, and he's on a tear, and he's going around, he's yelling at her, and he's slamming the kitchen cupboards, and they're glass, and you can hear them rattling, and you can hear them breaking. Then he goes over with a big glass of wine, and he has a huge bottle of wine, and he pours more in there. And then she says, did you drink all of that? And then he sees that he's, she's videotaping him, and bam. That's going to be a pretty graphic one for you to see. In order to understand the language of attorneys, it's important to understand a concept that's even older than rhetorical appeals. The concept of narrative. There's narrative form and narrative function. The first narrative form element is characters. There's the protagonist, the hero with good qualities. And there's the antagonist, the enemy with bad traits. The second form element is theme, the meaning of the narrative. These form elements serve two function elements identification between the audience, the narrator, and the protagonist in the narrative, and persuasion. This is where the narrator taps into certain values and behavior in order to get the audience to emote. In Elaine's narrative, Elaine is the narrative who is on the same side as the protagonist, Amber. Johnny is the antagonist. The theme is to underline that Amber is a victim of Johnny's transgressions, not the other way around. Let's see how these form elements play out. Then you're going to hear audio tapes, which are pretty significant too. Ben told you about the May 2014 plane, Boston plane incident, we call it, where he was so drunk and he blacked out. Well, Amber audio taped him when he went to the back of the plane and passed out and was moaning loudly. You will hear that. You will also hear some other audio tapes that are very significant. One of them in Australia at the end of the three-day hostage situation. You will hear, apparently, Mr. Depp turned on Ms. Hurd's iPhone. She was never allowed to have a password, by the way. He would never let her do that during their relationship. But he must have inadvertently turned it on. There's five hours of audio tape. It's during the cleanup of all the broken glass and the, the liquor and everything else in that house and you can hear his handlers and that you can hear them say she's stone cold sober you will hear all of that it's very very significant evidence what this is going to tell you is the story of a very different Johnny Depp it's one who is always uh, always well I can't say always because he has the charismatic side that Amber fell in love with but he has an enormous amount of rage. You will see the medical records and hear from the psychiatrist that talked to him for a while in 2014, where he admits that he has rage, that he views his, his wife, Amber, like his mother and his sister that he hates. Um, that's, the, that's what you will see. You will see that. And it'll be fueled by the alcohol and the drugs. Ben told you a little bit about that. You're going to see a list of his prescription drugs that his concierge doctor and team, who charge him $100,000 a month and have since 2014, and they are still his concierge doctors, that's the list of the medications he takes in one day that they prescribe. That doesn't include the cocaine. It doesn't include the ecstasy, the MDMA, the mushrooms, and all of the others. Elaine's statement that the jury will see a different Johnny and her admission that Johnny has a charismatic side that Amber fell in love with are again ways of anticipating objections. The statement, a different Johnny, presupposes that the jury has a positive perception of him, and her admission acknowledges the perception that some of the members might have of Johnny, 
before she then makes sure to insert the conjunction but. This conjunction emphasizes the point that's more convenient for her to make. Johnny's quote, enormous rage. When trying to persuade someone about something, it's a useful tactic to meet them at eye level and acknowledge what you think they believe before you broaden and eventually change the perspective they have. I've also pointed out the praise of opponents as a tactic to win them over in this video. You can find the link in the description. By mentioning Johnny's negative traits, Ambrose by inference associated with the opposite qualities, good qualities. However, inference is not enough in opening statements. You have to articulate these good qualities, and this is what Elaine does in the following. She starts by making Ambrose sound like the underdog next to Johnny, as if she's less known. Also, it's sensitive to Elaine to emphasize that Amber grew up poor even though this has little or nothing to do with the case. That's how important pathos is in court cases. Overall, these details strengthen Elaine's victim narrative. Let me introduce you to Amber, the lesser known person here. And I know when we were doing the voir dire, none of you had even watched as much as three of her movies. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Amber. She's 35 years old. She's from Austin, Texas. She grew up outside of Austin, Texas. She has a daughter, Una, who turned one last week. Amber grew up in, in a, an area, her father was a construction worker, primarily a painter, but he would break horses as part-time. They lived out on a, a ranch area. His, her mother, Paige, who died at, at, two years ago at age 63, dropped out of medical school to marry Amber's father. She worked for the state of Texas in intranet communications. Um, they grew up very poor. Amber has a sister, Whitney, who's 16 months younger than her. Um, and you will see and hear from Whitney later. With all the narrative form elements in place, we're starting to see how they're linked to the narrative function elements, identification and persuasion. Linguistically, Elaine creates identification between the jury and Amber. It's easier for most people to empathize with poor people than big Hollywood stars with anger issues like Johnny, supposedly. That's why Elaine portrayed Amber as less known, even though Amber's actually been part of significant Hollywood productions and has been known for many years. Elaine makes sure to mention Amber's family relations. Linguistically, this ensures relatability. The mention of family relations taps into people's emotions and values and is thus part of Elaine's persuasion techniques. Elaine's next persuasion technique is to associate Amber's childhood with why she was with Johnny for so long. Again, this is about anticipating any objection that the jury or Johnny's attorneys might have. Amber rode horses with her father. She tried to work with him to help him break the horses. She remembers having a broken arm at least four times being in casts during that time. But there were some things she learned from breaking those horses that was very significant. Her father taught her she couldn't show fear, she couldn't show pain, and she couldn't show emotion. That's how she could break those horses. It's significant for you to know that so you can understand how Amber could have remained in this relationship with Mr. Depp for as long as she could because that's what would be her instinct is to stand up and not let him show that he's caused the pain, that he's caused the fear, that he's caused the humiliation. This is a protective strategy, which functions as a way of making excuses for why Amber might have seemed cold in the past, and more importantly, why she might seem cold in this court case. With her words, Elaine indirectly shows awareness of this. So if anybody objects to the way Amber's behaving, Elaine can then say it's because of Amber's childhood, even though all we have is Elaine's word for it, before a causal connection between Amber's childhood and her current behavior can be made, the relevant details of a childhood need to be established by an external source. Thus, Elaine's argument is an emotional one. The emotional appeal continues, but in a more exaggerated fashion. Elaine touches on the emotional concept of the American dream, trying to make Amber sound like someone who achieved fame and fortune the hard way. The concept of the American dream has become a profitable way for politicians and other charlatans to try to feed into people's emotions. In the following, Elaine portrays Amber as a relatable person 
who worked hard for her fame, which in theory makes Amber easier to relate to. You'll hear about a long line of jobs that Amber started from back, you know, age 12 as soon as she could, working in a soup kitchen, well that was volunteer, but then she took all kinds of miscellaneous jobs, lifeguards, everything else, trying to improve herself. She's not somebody who had a great break. What happened was she got recognized by a Hollywood agent who expressed some interest in her. She took her $180 that she'd saved up and she went to LA. That's all she had to her name. The testimony will be she worked all kinds of different jobs when she was in LA, anything that she could get. And she would go on, but she didn't have a vehicle. So she would go on buses and she'd go up to six, six different auditions in one day. She'd have a map and she'd have in the bust, and then she would just go around. She had a big sweater, so she could change underneath it to whatever the role was, so that she could get things. And she wasn't going for you know, famous actor roles. She was taking one-liners, she was taking extras, she was doing anything she could to make money to survive. And then you know what she did with it? She gave a bunch of it back to her parents. She started helping support them. Then when Whitney graduated from high school, she brought her out to LA, and, and put a house roof over her house and put her through community college. She took care of her family with what she made. Besides narrative elements in the statements themselves, the opening statement also follows a narrative structure. It starts with the presentation of characters and conflicts before the elaboration sets in. The elaboration is prior to the structure elements, conflict escalation and climax. Its function is to emphasize the roles of protagonist and antagonist with specific examples. Elaine underlines Johnny's role as the antagonist by portraying him as a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde-like figure, that he's one person on camera and another person off camera. Again, we should note that while Elaine's saying this, Amber's behavior is implied as the positive opposite of Johnny's. So during the press trips, that's when they started dating and, by both accounts, fell madly in love. She loved the side of Johnny that we see in the movies, the charismatic one, the charming one, the generous one. That's the man she fell in love with. But sadly, the monster came in the way. Um, and that monster would come out when he was drinking and, and when he would take the drugs. One of the most effective ways to give the protagonist a regular man a woman quality is to associate the antagonist with abnormal traits, such as behaving in a disproportionate way. Elaine does this in the following. Amber will never forget the first event. She was sitting in his house in Sweetser on the sofa and he was across from her and they were talking about a tattoo that he had that had, had had Winona, Winona Ryder, forever. He had altered that to wine forever after he broke up with Winona Ryder. Just an aside, he had Slim, which was his nickname for Amber. When they broke up, he turned it to scum. But in any event, he had that on there, and Amber thought he was making a joke when he was talking about it, and she laughed, and he up and now you see the rings that Mr. Depp has on him hurts when he slaps. And she was stunned. She, she had no idea what to think. And she kind of laughed thinking, well, maybe that was a joke. I, 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 what just happened? And he slapped her again. And then she just froze and just looked. And then he slapped her again. And this time it knocked her right off the sofa under the ground. And she remembers her face was in this dirty, filthy carpet. That's what she remembers and fixated on, the dirty carpet. And she's thinking, oh my God, I have to leave. I have to leave. But I love him. I have to leave. But I love him. And she sat there for the longest time. She laid there for the longest time. Then Johnny came off the sofa, got on his knees, started crying told her he was very, very sorry that he had done this, it would never happen again, and he said some very significant words. I thought I had put the monster away for good. That's what he said to her that day. Well, Amber ended up leaving that day, and she went out to her car, her Mustang, and she remembers that it was cold, and she sat in the car for the longest time, and she remembers watching her breath because it was cold, and she was thinking, I have to leave him. 
but I love him. She just kept thinking that. She finally drove away. But Amber made the mistake that millions before her and millions after her have, who are victims. She chose to stay and try to fix the problem and thinking that she could do that. So she stayed. By associating Amber with millions, Elaine achieves two things. She again makes Amber seem relatable and she relieves Amber of the responsibility that some jury members could think Amber had to leave the relationship if it was so bad. Of course, the things Elaine achieves on a linguistic level rest on the presupposition that this is the truth. But this court case about finding out what the truth actually is, this means that truth can't be presupposed. This is always important to keep in mind when sad stories are told. I'll keep an eye on this case. What do you think of the opening statement?